Welcome to Back Porch Chats, where we have conversations about hope, grace, and recovery. Our mission is to shape 12-step communities where sponsors and sponsees support each other to move beyond the shame of abuse. We are dedicated to sharing knowledge about the connection between addiction and sexual abuse with people who are struggling to stop their destructive, compulsive behavior. Are you ready to embrace freedom from your past trauma? And help others do the same? If so, grab a cup of coffee. And join the conversation on the back porch with Vince and Gina. All right, Gina, another podcast here at backportschats.com, the podcast for recovery. Got a good guest today, somebody that uh, I'm really jealous of. Um, I've already started hating him because of the <laughs> lifestyle that he has. Um, you know, makes me feel um, inferior and like a chicken shit all at the same time. <laughs> Can I, can I say chicken shit? I can't, I don't know that I can say chicken shit. You can there. say it. That's your podcast. Yeah. <laughs> we can put a, put a little sound over chicken shit. <laughs> but you had a question that you wanted to ask. Or, yeah. Yeah. Or, well, go ahead. Our, our guest today wrote a book. It's titled Alcoholics Not Anonymous. And um, it got me thinking, and I think he's going to talk about it a little bit, but it got me thinking, what is your take on anonymous? Well, I, you know, I've been in the rooms of um, this anonymous stuff, 12-step stuff for 28 years. And when I first got into it, the anonymous was about me not wanting to be found out, you know, mm-hmm. want, wanting to be uh, be able to come in safe and explore all that and not be posed. But as I got into it, it got to be less and less important, uh, that kind of stuff, because everybody knew that I needed to be there. I was yeah. the last one that knew that, that I needed to be there. But I, I think for some, a lot of people early on in the recovery, that kind of anonymity is important. Um, but then the, it developed to me where that the really important part of anonymity is that, um, the AA doesn't need to have anybody associated. We don't need a star. We don't need a big marketing person out there that when it comes to that sort of stuff, we need to just kind of lay back. Right. Because right. If there's one thing in common with all of us is these huge egos. And so, you know, we'd spoil it. So that's kind of the two things. But I know from reading with our what our guest had today that uh, he's got a little bit different perspective and he reached it. Mm-hmm. And it's actually one that that I really respect because there's, there's that whole attraction and promotion thing that we talked about in the room. We, right. You know, right. We use attraction, not promotion, but if nobody knows, so. I'm going to shut up. I don't want to hear it, but why don't you go ahead and give a background a little bit so that everybody else can start hating on him. Like I do. (laughs) No one's going to hate on him. Um, our, our guest is Paul Trammell. He's author of seven books and a sailor. And I'm really excited to hear about, um, life on the sea. Um, his books are, um, uh, my um, alcoholics, not anonymous, which I just talked about and the joy in living clean and sober. And then of course he's got seven, five other books. Those are, um, nonfiction. Paul? Three are nonfiction, two are novels. Two are novels. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, I thought that's what they were. Um, anyways, um, so he's going to talk to us about an alcoholics, his book, his story, give us his story, and I am stuttering so bad today. Um, and he's going to talk about sailing and how um, sailing keeps him so- sober. Uh, welcome to the show, Paul Trammell. Glad to have you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on. It's an yeah, honor. You're welcome. A pleasure. So- that uh, we talk so much about recovery and alcoholism and everything. I really just as soon talk about sailing and why I hate you. Cause mm-hmm. you kind of getting to live that life out there on the boat, wake up every day, salt water in your nose, in your hair, the salt light. Yep. If you don't like where you are, you just pull up the rope and head on. What's that like? Yep. How, how did you get into that? I, you know, that, that is absolutely so awesome to have that courage to break those binds and do that yeah i mean how i got here is a great question and um you know the answer to it uh, has a lot to do with your podcast and your the subject here because sailing started as both a reward and a substitute for you know a reward for one year of sobriety and a substitute for uh, what drinking used to used to uh do for me the, the, right I mean, I mean the the, the not, not the getting sick part and the addicted right. part but the uh but the, the fun of it, sure. the fun and the excitement. Unless of um, course you're it, seasick like me, I'm, I'd be getting sick every day. 
Well, yeah, you know what? That there, there, there's some similarities there, aren't there? Uh, you get used to that, though. Some, some people don't ever get over seasickness, but most of us uh, experience it in the beginning, and then, and then get used to it and get over it. And that's, that's the way it's been for me. But, but sailing all started, like I said, um, I, I, I developed my own method for getting sober or for staying sober. Um, and I've actually been to maybe three or four AA meetings in my life, so I am familiar somewhat familiar with the, with the process and the, and the 12 steps and and there's a lot of overlap with, with what I did and the 12 steps but uh I'm just not a group therapy kind of person um you know I'm a solo sailor right. uh, I do a lot I do I'm happy doing things myself and and every you know and no one method of anything works for everybody so so anyway, you know, I, some people, some people, I mean, that that's a very, very valid point you make. Some people are, are you know, introverts, some people extrovert, some people love being with themselves and by themselves and are complete, completely happy and content and are very uncomfortable in a crowd. So that that's good. Right. And one size doesn't fit all, Paul, you know, so. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so one of the things I did um, when I was getting sober my first year was I, I took cash I would have otherwise spent on, on alcohol and put it in a box and I would occasionally pull it out and hold the cash and look at it and think think about you know the month like look at it as a reward like here's something tangible that I've got in my hand that I wouldn't have had otherwise so it's a nice it's a nice way of just reminding yourself that that there is something to gain when you're going through the hard times of not drinking anymore right. uh, in the first right. year as everybody knows is 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 pretty tough so as that first year wore on, I decided I should, I should spend that money on something. Eventually I shouldn't just keep, you know, forever saving cash. Um, and that, and that gave me a goal. So I, I thought, well, after one year, I will spend this on something. And at first I thought it was going to be a cool vacation. And then, and then I started, but then I started remembering an old dream I had, which was to be a sailor. And I had given up on it because the more you drink, the less you can sail. Uh, it's not something you can do when you're when you're drunk, um, especially if, if we're talking about offshore sailing. Right. Uh, you, you know, sailors have a reputation of drinking, um, but it's not true for those of us that sail offshore and, and actually travel. Um, most most sailors who drink don't drink when they're sailing offshore. It's just right. They just right. don't work to get well together. It's difficult and dangerous enough as it is. Um, and you have to be able to, to go to sleep quickly and wake up quickly and keep your balance, et cetera, et cetera. So I bought a one week sailing class with my, the money I had saved and I immediately fell in love with it. Mm -hmm. And it was, it had already been a long-term dream of mine, but it just, it just exploded and snowballed and, and I ran with it. And within a year I had bought a boat and, and I just kept, kept working that dream and chasing it and learning and reading and th yeah that's another thing about quitting drinking all of a sudden i was reading again right right you know i, I read books as a child and then as i became a you know an alcoholic adult i couldn't <laughs> yeah most of the most of my reading time was before bed when i was younger but then of course when you got 12 beers in you you're, you're not reading before, when you lay down to go to sleep you know um and the same thing with smoking weed i was a big weed smoker too and right. i right. i quit before, i quit that as well yeah, before we go down that road, tell us a little bit about the boat behind you. I'm interested in in your boat. Sure. What did you end up getting there? This is called a Cartwright 40. Uh, Jerry Cartwright designed it. Uh, it was built in 1972. It's 40 feet long. Um, it uh, it's got a flush deck, which means most of the deck is flat, so you can move about on it and tie your dinghy to it. Uh, it's got a long full keel. It's heavy, it's strong, it's powerful. It's, it's built um, for sailing on the ocean as, as a lot of boats were in the seventies. Um, mm -hmm. Today's boats are, are sort of marketed a little bit differently. Um, but back in the seventies, if you were gonna buy a boat and go sailing, there was no GPS back then. There was very little communication. There was no communication once you were offshore. Right. Weather right. forecasting was, was, was nothing to what it is today. So sailors back then, faced a little bit more hardship and danger. So a lot of the boats were built um, much more for safety and comfort 
and and not not for speed so much so that yeah, so that's that's great for me because i i don't i'm not in any hurry i just want to be comfortable and get there safely and and uh and, and even more than that have confidence so anyway it's a 40 foot sailboat it's simple um it was inexpensive i spent a, i did a lot of work to it but old boats are cheap and and this is where i live now i sold my house in 2019 i quit my job sold my house um and, and what really it made this dream work was the fact that I started writing books mm -hmm. and, and that's, that's what I'm, that's what I'm doing now. I just, I spend, I know every day I, I treat it like a job every day I, I write. Right. Um, and that's, and that's how I intend to, uh, you know, perpetuate this lifestyle. And that help keeps the wolf, the wolves away from the doors, as they say. You're, you're... The wolves are, are, yeah, the wolves are all on land. They can't get out here. <laughs> <They> can't <swim. laughs> that's yeah. another thing. My, my boat is a sanctuary. Yeah. There's yeah. no alcohol on the boat ever. Right. There's no drugs on the boat. It's just, it's just pure, clean peace of mind here on, on, on Windflower. That can be important. They, at, when we make it a little bit hard to go get drugs and alcohol, it kind of gives us a little chance to think about what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. You know, and the more you change, when you're trying to get sober and change your life, I mean, don't think of it as just, just getting sober and just quitting drinking. You're changing your life. And, and the more, I think, the more you change, the better chance you're going to have of succeeding because it's a new life and you need a new identity. Mm -hmm. Not just, not just, I don't drink anymore. Like it's, it's going to be a whole new you. And, and I took it to the extreme. I, I, I left, you know, moving out of your, your town, move, moving to a new place uh, is beneficial because you're not going to have, all your drinking buddies. You're not going to have, you're not going to see all the bars you used to go to. You're not going to drive by the liquor store where you bought your alcohol from it. You're not going to have all your old triggers and temptations. It's all going to be new. So I think personally, the more you change, the better. Mm -hmm. you, 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 even when you look at yourself in the mirror, you want to see a, a new, a new person there. You want to, and, and you want to, and you also want to feel the rewards of it. Uh, I think taking on, uh, fun athletic type endeavors helps because then you're going to see you're going to see and feel the rewards of being healthier you know because alcohol obviously makes you very unhealthy and un unathletic do you know it, yeah it dwarfs us physically and emotionally and spiritually and um, intellectually in a yeah. lot of different ways i i yes. one of the things when i'm working in the things that i like to do people is look we all got into drugs and alcohol and everything because it was fun because it did something for us. Either if we yep. couldn't dance, we could dance. We could talk to the girls, or, or if we mm -hmm. were in pain, we none. So it, it did something for us. And if you just quit drinking and drugging and, and don't find a way to have fun, which you've talked about, or find meaning or purpose, yep. or fun, uh, then the chances of you returning back to drinking and drugging is just high because you're going to want to try to find that fun in your life so i think part of the challenge yep. of getting when we quit drinking and drugging is to do exactly what you did for yourself is find that that area of contentment yeah. and satisfaction and fun absolutely you need substitutes you know and sailing was a substitute and lots of other things were too. I mean, you need you need lots of different kinds of substitutes for me mm -hmm. um let's just yep. start at the very beginning you know day one i'm not drinking my hands are looking for that beer to grab a hold of right. my mouth wants that cold carbonated beverage so why not get some you know Lacroix soda soda mm -hmm. water right mm -hmm. you know flavored soda water it's you can just chug it like you can drink 12 of them right you know just like you used to drink 12 beers and it's not going to hurt you it's just water essentially so you know it's not soda it doesn't have sugar in it I'm not talking mm -hmm. about sodas I'm talking about just like carbonated water with a right. hint of mm -hmm. fruit flavor that was a substitute for me um I also got down on some chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, why not? Like how many chocolate chip cookies does it take to be as unhealthy as 12 beers? I don't no. think you can eat that many, you know? No. No. So why not? In the beginning, you know, I say treat yourself to some cookies and some LaCroix or whatever it is that's going to work for you because nothing, almost nothing is going to be as, you know, except for another drug, it's going to be as bad as all the alcohol. So you need substitutes. And then you need substitutes for the fun and the excitement of, of, of whatever it was that the alcohol did for you or the drugs did for you. Um, so I was looking for adventure. Uh, I started re re realizing that I wasn't as adventurous as I had used to be. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and this is another, how, how did it all start kind of answer to your question? Um, I wanted a big adventure. 
I wanted something like like big time. So I'm looking for it, and somebody suggested the Oki Finoki Swamp, you know, of all places. And we were just they talking said, uh, about that yesterday. You guys were just talking about it? No way. <laughs> Oki, come out of nowhere, went out of nowhere, went to nowhere, but it was funny now. Here you are talking about it. He's yeah, like, well, somebody said, it. somebody said Oki Finoki, and I thought, well, I, I had applied for the lottery to, to canoe the Snake River in Utah, mm-hmm. you know, and I didn't get it. Um, but I had the canoe. And someone said Oki Finoki, and I thought, well, yeah, that's, that sounds cool. You looked into it. You know, you guys probably know now you, you rent uh, platforms to camp on, and they're, and they're out by themselves, miles mm-hmm. from anything else. Just one platform, nothing on it, nobody else around. You got to canoe all day to get there. There's alligators. I mean, I mean alligators yeah. everywhere, mm-hmm. and, and I'm terrified of alligators. So the thrill... The thrill was on all day, every day when I was canoeing, <laughs> yeah. you know, and it was out there when I was canoeing from one platform to another that I thought like, golly, this reminds me, this is so much fun. I'm out in the wilderness, I'm moving, I'm on the water. And this reminds me of something. I'm thinking, what does this remind me of? And then it hit me. I mean, it hit me like a light bulb, like a flash of lightning. It reminded me of sailing on the ocean with my father as a child and not being able to see land for the first time. You know, that that's a that's a that's a memory like a good strong clear memory of mine that that one morning when i came up stuck my head out of the hatch and looked around and didn't see land and i looked behind me and i didn't see land there either it was no there was no land to be seen so that's that that that's when it hit me you got to be a sailor you got to get back into sailing you know you got to remember that dream you used to have and chase it and and um that's that right there is is, is when it all started and here i am five or six years later in the Bahamas, you know, on the, living on a boat. Uh, it's, it is a wonderful thing. Right. And, and it's all because I quit drinking. You've said several things that I, I, you know, totally believe in for recovery. We need to um, search, go towards something, you know, I mean, we can sit and whine about not being able to drink or we can go get something, which is what you did with the, um, you know, with the selling and then the mm-hmm. rewards, it's, it's important to reward yourself. I always said, you know, um, I like to play pool and people are, you know, when I first got sober, I would go to pool halls and people, you know, would like, why are you going there? That's temptation. That's temptation. And I said, because I'm not going to punish myself for doing something good. I like to play pool. I'm going to continue to play pool and I don't mm-hmm. anymore, but you know, I, so I did that. And, um, and then, um, you completely took yourself out of the environment completely yes so that there's nothing even you know remotely like i mean i'm sure there's something but you don't have the people triggering you and you don't have you know a lot of things and, and i might have already said this but the rewards you gave yourself and these these are this is what i keep telling people over and over again you know these things specifically reward yourself search for something don't run from something search mm-hmm. for something and i love the way you've done that especially on a boat yeah you, you got to you got to make something good of it because it is something good, but you're not going to realize it if, if you're just going to look at it as pain and suffering the, the whole time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, getting sober means, means health and it means mental clarity. Um, it means, it means getting younger for a few years instead of right. older. Right. You know? Right. And, and so if, if, if you're, if you continue doing all the same things, you might not realize that and you're not going to benefit, you're not going to realize the benefit and you've got a much better chance of, of relapsing that way. You got to you got to grab the bull by the horns, and you got to you got to find what's good about it, and you got to appreciate it, and remind yourself of it. You know, not just not not just do something cool and fun, and, but remind yourself while you're doing it. I'm right. I am doing this. I'm able to do this because I'm not a drunk anymore. You right. know, like I'm able to go backpacking, for instance, because because I don't have to have a cooler full of beer right next to me. You know? I've actually like, seen I was... people backpack that way, by the way. Yeah, right. I mean, you can carry. Like, really, you're taking a cooler of beer and into Yosemite? <laughs> right. So you're, you can't you can't go as far. You could go a lot further without that cooler of beer, you know? Um, so you got to remind yourself that, that that you are benefiting from, from being sober. You got to constantly. I mean, still, seven years later, I still wake up in the morning. Yeah, sure. And I think, and I think I am not hungover today i feel great like i'm getting that's five in the morning i'm awake the stars are still out i'm gonna go sit up on deck of my boat and drink some coffee and watch the sunrise again mm-hmm. you know like i do every morning because i'm not hung over right yeah i still remind myself of the, of the the benefits of not being a drunk anymore 
You know, uh, Paul, what I'm relating to as you go here, you know, we talk about the spiritual reconnection and a lot of people in the, the 12 step room and stuff here that is God and it is and all that sort of stuff. But there's another component of this whole spiritual part for me, which is what you just talked about in that, in that, you know, there's the spirit, like the football team has the cheerleaders that, you know, it's the spirit team, the raw, raw team, you know? So uh, there's this spirit, this reconnection to ourselves, to the spirit of ourselves or our soul. Also the spirit of connection to the, the mystery of the universe that's bigger than we are that provides, you know, I know that, you know, like you and your sailboat, I wondered if you've ever been that place out in the middle of it. And, you know, there's this mysterious source that you can't see called the wind that's pushing you around, you know, taking you places and that sort of stuff. So, and I, and I don't really have a question here. I guess I got to come up with one, but, but uh, you know, but, but there's just that connection, this spiritual connection with ourselves. That's so important to the, the this mystery in, in life that's a funds part of it, but there's a, you know, sitting up on the deck, watching a sunset with a cup of coffee. That's another part of it. A reading, intellectual studies, all of these different things, physical activities, proper nutrition, but all of that re reconnects us to the spirit within ourselves. No, question. Well, you're absolutely no, right. No. <laughs> yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And, and you can't have any of that without mental clarity and you right. can't have mental clarity with drugs. Right. But, you know, you, you, you could, you think some people think they do, but you know, not, I mean, not with alcohol, alcohol doesn't do it at all. Right. But a lot of, but a lot of pot smokers are going to think that, that they're, that they're getting, they're getting something like that from the weed, but it's just a cheap shortcut that gets you, that gets you a, a small fraction of the way to where you really want to go and never any further. And, and to really get there, you've got to have clarity of mind and you can't have clarity of mind with, with any drug you know, in your system. And, uh, and I contradict myself right then and there because I drink coffee while I'm, well, <laughs> while I'm meditating if, in the morning. If but Hey, you know, sugar, if it wasn't for sugar, caffeine and nicotine, most alcoholics wouldn't get sober, but they, uh, yes. you know, they got to have all of those and all three of those are. A yeah. So I, yeah, mind. exactly. But so I, even, I grant myself license there. But um, even if you're one of those that likes to go on these spiritual trips with the halluc hallucinogenics and that sort of stuff, and you get a shaman, I got some friends that's done that sort of stuff. I, I personally haven't, but you know, they've done all that, but even them doing that, they eventually have to return to some state of sobriety to even enjoy the benefits of that. They have to get clean. They can't stay right. there. You can't do that. It's something that maybe works for a little bit, but all of it will quit working, especially when you start abusing it. Absolutely. You know, and I, and I, I played around with hallucin hallucinogens um, when I was in my 20s uh, a little bit. I never I never really got into it. It's a bit heavy for, for me to do that more than like once a year is about what I did for 10 years, maybe. Um, but but right. You, you can't you can't just do something like that over and over again. And if you really want to connect with with the spirit whether whether that's god or or whether that's nature or whether that's something without a name uh, you can't do it without clarity of mind and you can't have clarity of mind unless you're sober so that's a, just that's another reward for sobriety of, of sobriety and and my my morning ritual is every single morning uh, i i make my coffee and I'm, I'm up before well before the sun so i make my coffee and i go sit up on the deck of my boat and i stretch uh, I do I do a half an hour of yoga for the for the stretching benefit because I, I, I I'm 51 years old and I still surf mm -hmm. and and do all kinds of athletic type things um, and I don't want to get hurt so that's why that's why the yoga but then the next half hour is is meditation mm -hmm. and it's just it's just trying to to sit with a clear mind and and take in the beauty around me and look at the the sunrise uh, every morning and appreciate the fact that that I'm appreciate what I'm doing, you know, again, appreciate the clarity of mind, the health, the sobriety, um, and, and just uh, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you know, you're alive, you're here on earth alive. Uh, you need to find something to appreciate every day, uh, or else you're just not going to be happy. So it's all, that's what it all boils down to is being happy. Um, I'm a lot happier sober than I was drunk every day. I'm, 
every day I'm healthy. I'm not beating myself up, you know, between waking and noon, you know, mm-hmm. that's how it used to always be. I would be hung over every day and I would, and I would say to myself, Oh, why do you do this to yourself every day? Here you go again, hung over. I don't ever want to drink again. And then come noon. Oh, is it noon yet? Can I have a beer yet? Yeah, <laughs> you know, right back at it. You're, you, you, in my marriage life, back when I was drinking, I, there was one other thing that I got woken up to, especially in those bad nights, was my wife telling me all the stuff that I did the night before that I don't oh. remember doing. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I had no. To do that, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's terrifying, isn't it? That's happened to me a few times, too. It's, a, yeah. it's not Here's- cool at all here's no. one i went to i went to bed just fine and broke up with a couple broken ribs i don't know how that happened either <laughs> oh gosh Jeez. <laughs> that's new i haven't done that one that's that was new thought i'd done everything paul but i got there's a new one the um so in your book you kind of you know wrote this down uh codified for mm-hmm. lack of a better word your process so what mm-hmm. is what 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 did you write down what what is your process there Okay. Um, the first book, Alcoholics Not Anonymous, A Modern Way to Quit Drinking, that that all started from advice I was giving to other people. So my my method and, and, the, and the place the title comes from is that I decided to be open about it and um, tell everybody. Mm-hmm. So after just a few days of not drinking, you know, for instance, I called my brother and I told him, and I asked him to check in on me, you know, as, as, as often as he thought about it, I asked him, you know, if you can do this every day, that'd be perfect. Like, just, just send me a text or, or call me and just, just ask me if I'm still sober. Cause I need to be accountable. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I think that's crucial. You gotta be, and, and I'm sure that's what, you know, AA provides too. Um, you gotta be accountable to somebody mm-hmm. so that, so that if you relapse, there's penalty, mm-hmm. you're going to look like a, you're going to look like a jerk, you know, or a failure to everybody who you're accountable to. So, I, I wanted the accountability um, and uh, I came, so I came right out on Facebook and, and after a week and said, Hey, hey everybody, I've been seven days without drinking a beer. This is the first time wow. in, in many, many, many years that I've gone seven days without a beer. I mean, maybe the first time, probably the first time since I quit 20 years ago, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. so, and, and I got so much support. I mean, maybe a hundred people commented on that. Good job. You know, people I didn't know yeah. were commenting, saying, good job. You know, we're proud of you. Good job. Keep at it. I couldn't believe it. So every, every little milestone, um, I kept on doing that and I kept on getting support. And then, and then strangers started asking me for advice. Strangers would, would send me direct messages and say, uh, you know, your posts are really expire- inspiring. I've been following you and your journey to you know getting sober and and uh, I really want to do it but I don't know how to start you know how did you how did you pull the trigger and, or people would say I've been sober for a week and and I got this you know and I got a, a party that I'm supposed to go to how do you deal with that or somebody else would say I want to I want to quit drinking but but you know how am I going to deal with with New Year's Eve and how am I going to deal with Christmas and Thanksgiving and how am I going to deal with the Super Bowl and my buddy's birthday that we've been getting wasted together, you know, once a year for the last 30, like, how am I going to deal with all that? You know, those are all great questions that really require a solid answer to. So mm-hmm. I would sit down and think about it. And, and then I would write, I would write them back every time, you know, and they would, and they would keep sending me questions. So eventually I came to realize, you know, I've got, I've got a book here. If I can consolidate all this mm-hmm. and, and, and think about it some more and, 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 uh, so that's how the book became, you know, a book. And, um, you know, I, I have direct advice. The book isn't just, just like philosophical me talking and rambling. It's like, if you do this and if you do this, and if you do this, or at least, or at least I did this, 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 and this, and it worked for me, you know, and part of it, like we've already said is using substitutes. And part of it is, 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 is going into your refrigerator and pulling the beer out and pouring it into the toilet, you know, or going into your liquor cabinet and dumping that liquor right straight into the toilet and looking at it, go down there and think to yourself, like, what else goes down the toilet? You know, is this, is this mm-hmm. not, nothing I want to drink, you know, and here it goes. I mean, you got to make associations, you got to uh-huh. trick, trick your mind like that, you know, make associations. Now, when I think about, uh, whenever I see alcohol now, I say gross, you know, to myself, gross. Ah, that's, that's freaking gross. 
ugh, and I think, ugh, nausea, hangover. Uh, remember that time? You know, I, I try to remember like laying down on the floor of the bathroom with the spins, you know, uh, mm-hmm. about to throw up. It, it, you got to associate alcohol with negative things. And, and it's not hard to do because there are a lot of negative things, <laughs> at least yeah. as many negatives as there are positives more. Uh, I'm sure more. A lot so it's more easy to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A lot more. It's easy to think of the bad, the bad uh, and remember that. So there, there are a lot of little things like that I do. And I mentioned, what do you, you know, what do you do when, when uh, people ask me, what, what am I going to do about new year's Eve? Well, let's not, uh, I even think about New Year's Eve right now. This is what this is where AA has it right. You know, just we're just we're just going to be sober for today. We'll take that to the next the next step. Uh, mm-hmm. We feel a craving to drink. You know, it's day three. I've been two days without alcohol, and I know that the Seven Eleven is right down the street, and they got they got beer there. You know, I can mm-hmm. just go buy it. So you're thinking, do I do it? Do I do I grab the key? No, 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 stop. You know, let's just not drink right now. Like right now, not not today. We're not talking about three hours from now. We're talking about right this very second. All right. So I've got past this, 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 it's been 10 seconds now. All right. 10 seconds. So am I going to drink right now? Nope. Nope. We got another 10 seconds. And, and 30 seconds later, the craving's not there anymore. You passed it. And now you got to say to yourself, well, what did I just do? I just beat a craving for one of the world's most addictive drugs. Mm-hmm. Like that's big. That's big time. That's like, that's like bench pressing more than your max ever. Yeah. It's like yeah. hitting a new goal. So, so congratulate yourself, you know, congratulate, tell yourself, good job. I did it. Okay. Not only that, now you're stronger. Mm-hmm. You have, you have succeeded at one of the world's most difficult things. Even if it's just for three days or 10 seconds, you've done it. So you got to congratulate yourself, realize that you're actually stronger because of it. And, and, and no, and have confidence that next time a craving strikes, you're going to be able to do that again. And it might not even be as hard next time. And, and that's what you do instead of thinking about New Year's Eve, you know, that's three true. months from now or whatever, six months, a yeah. year. That's awesome. That's exactly the yeah. process. That That's just yeah. exactly it. Yeah. So that's I'm like one chapter of my that. book right there. You know, there's, right. and there's yeah. 10, 10 or 12. It's a short book. I mean, that's like, that's a book you can read in three hours. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. It's, <laughs> just, you know, it, Paul? It, it's not... It's what, not a lot of fluff. Well, what what we need to do is easy and simple, but it's hard to do. <laughs> you know, that's right. You you you've made it uh, straightforward and simple, uh, and and I love that. And it is the process. I relate to everything that you've said. I know that for me, yeah. pouring the alcohol out, just pouring that was such a huge milestone for me. You know, er- mm-hmm. every time before. I decided to quit. It was, well, when this bottle's done, when this bottle's done. And then of course, yeah. I buy more bottles, but this, you know, well, I'm not throwing it out. Let me just finish this bottle. I don't, I don't know how many times I did that, but, but when I was mm-hmm. actually able to pour it out, that was just this biggest milestone because it really didn't even bother me that I was doing it, but it was the first time, you know, it bothered me. Yeah. Such a big deal. And at, and at that point you've made an investment. Right. And we're all, and everybody's loss averse. We all hate to think we wasted something. Mm-hmm. So, so if you pour out liquor and start drinking again, well, yeah, you wasted the value of that liquor, but if you right. pour it out and don't start again, now that small investment was, was, was what got the ball rolling. It's a small investment of money that you've already spent. Um, and, and it's, and it's only going to, you're only going to feel like you wasted it if you start again. So, oh, so, so there, there's another way to make it, to make there be a penalty right. for starting again. Well, and it becomes an investment in time, you know, which the couple of dollars I spent on the alcohol is no big deal, but I'm, you know, I'm three years sober now and there's an investment in time for me to relapse. Now would just devastate me. I would just, Oh yeah. Three, three years, you know, um, that would yeah. be better than pouring out. Right Absolutely. Point. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's why it's, imp- I think it's important to, to, to count, count mm-hmm. your days, count mm-hmm. your months count your years. Yeah. Uh, you know, think of it as a birthday. You know, I, I think of my, the day I quit drinking, it's February 3rd. Oh, it's coming up. Golly, it's coming up soon. February yeah. 3rd. It's going to be seven years. That's, that's more important than my birthday. Wow. I didn't do anything. You know, my mother should celebrate my birthday. She's the one who did something, you know, I get, I get my mom flowers for her birthday. I, I started doing that after I gave birth and she says, what's this for, for on my birthday? She says, what's this yes. for? And I says, I know what it feels like. You deserve flowers. 
<laughs> yeah, right. They're the ones who did all the work. Yeah. Correct. You know, yeah. That the, the birthday my, the, we need to celebrate them, and then we, the, we also need to celebrate every day that they didn't kill us for, <laughs> <laughs> for raising us. So my mom, my mom, I'd have probably have many days if my mom was still alive. Oh uh, yeah, my mom could have had a, a lot of excuses to kill me. That's for sure. Well, I will tell you this: that in the rooms, one of the things that we do <laughs> do there is seven years. Ah, oh, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. That is huge. I'm going to tell you, and congratulations. That's, that is a big deal. Seven years is, uh, thanks. That's awesome. Yeah. Congratulations. It's wonderful. It's, and it's so much easier now. It's, um, it's not much work anymore. Uh, I, mm -hmm. you know, as long as I keep doing what I'm doing, I, I don't, I'll never go back to drinking. You know, I don't, it never, it's never a threat anymore. Well, it's a new uh, habit that you've built and and you've had seven years to yeah this habit. I built a new habit and I built a life mm -hmm. around sobriety. I mean, for instance, when you write a book about staying sober, well, you're gonna real really be a jackass if you start drinking again. <laughs> yeah, you know? why do you think we got a I mean, podcast? <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, you guys like people look up to you now. You've got a podcast, but if you start drinking again, boy, you're gonna have to wrap it up and, and go hide somewhere, you know, like <laughs> You can't, you know. <laughs> uh, no, it, it, the more we become invested in, the more fun it is, uh, the easier it is. Yeah. I, I, um, I hardly ever think about drinking or drugging anymore. Of course, part of that's just the fact that I'm getting a little long in the tooth. I think I'm just not quite as mad at the world as I used to be. But, um, uh -huh. you, you know, but I, it, but it doesn't matter. I, I, it just doesn't call me, but there's still a lot of things that I got to stay in the middle of the road with this recovery for, you know, mm -hmm. keep, keep it strong. Cause I, I did have a, a friend who did, um, he had 25 years and he went back out. So it does happen. Oh gosh. How did that happen? How, how does someone with 25 years relapse? Like what makes it happen? Well, in this case, um, I, and I don't know that it, I'm just going to be honest about it. I don't know if it's a relapse in the sense that it, he, his life is still going really good and really great for him and everything, but he just got back to the place that maybe I, he started asking that question. Maybe I'm not, maybe I'm really not an alcoholic. Maybe I yeah. need to go back out here and really try. I've done 25 years without it. Maybe I'm not. Yeah. In his case, it looks like that might've been true. We, I don't want to get into the digest of what a real alcoholic is, but uh, but I have seen others that did that and were dead within six months too. To I know if yeah. they had 18 years and went back out and, and in, in six months he died of cirrhosis of the liver. So after, you know, that, that time. So, you know, I, there is a spiritual guarding that needs to happen for us. We need to stay close to w what it is that we did to stay sober. In your case, mm -hmm. I may, you know, you need to, be selling and you need to be writing and you need to be doing the things that you have done that make your life worth living sober Yep. that the risk of maybe I'm really not an alcoholic. Maybe I can drink again. Really the risk versus reward is not there for you. Right. I mean, there's no reward to me to go back to drinking. Um, right. I mean, it's cost a lot of money for one thing and I'm, I'm out here living on a boat on a, on a very small income trying to make it work. Like I'm not going to be spending more money on something stupid like that, but well, and, and, and I've been there drinking, where you, if you start drinking alcohol again, the open seas is no longer an option for you. And those, 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 those right. all processes, right. And right. Know. Right. Um, and I've been there where your friend is. Um, I quit. This is the third time I've quit drinking. Um, yeah. the, the, the second time I lasted two and a half years and I got to thinking, well, shoot, I've, you know, I've, I've obviously got control of this. Uh, what if I just started drinking, uh, my, my, my philosophy, <laughs> I thought if I drank expensive quality beer, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, I had to have like a couple and be happy with it instead of, instead of, you know, 10 cheap beers. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and it, and it to an outsider who saw that happen, they might've thought, well, yeah, obviously Paul's doing fine. You know, uh, I, I went many years doing just fine like that, but it slowly built back up to 12 beers a day, yeah. 12, 12 good beers. Now I was drinking 12 expensive <laughs> beers. Right. And, 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 and then it's like, you know, rot, rot gut wine is, you know, the best I can do. I'll do that. I, you know, and this whole thing, it, it 
it really what I have seen, I don't know if there's any science behind this, but what I have seen people that have been sober for a long time, when they go back and go back to drinking, it seems like that wherever they were drinking, if they just continued to drink, let's say 15 years, if they're 15 years sober, but if they'd continue to drink when they go back drinking, it seems like their body picks off at the 15 year mark. It doesn't go back 15 years ago. There's just something that their body seems to go down quicker. The physical mm -hmm. damage mm -hmm. that was there seems to come back just as quick as if they'd continued to drink. The emotional stunning is definitely mm -hmm. there. The intellectual uh. problems. So I, I don't know if that's true. I don't know if there's any science data. You got to be careful with what you observe, but that's been my observation in the 28 years that I've hung around these rooms. Seems to be that way. <laughs> Yeah, well, it, it's, I mean, why not? It's, it's absolutely destructive to every cell in your body. Mm -hmm. uh, every, every organ in your body, every cell in your body. It, it's, I mean, it just, it's, it's just poison in every sense of the word. And, mm -hmm. and the fact that it's the, that it's like available at the grocery store and the gas station and the, and the convenience store, and it's totally accepted by our society. is kind of baffling once you step away from it and look at it from well, you know, point of view. I mean, that legality, it, it, here's a phenomenon that I'm seeing in the 12-step uh, the rooms that I hang into with the opioid epidemic. Mm -hmm. We're getting housewives in there uh, who legitimately got prescribed some kind of Lortab or something for some kind of injury yeah. or something, and yeah. they became addicts slam bam thank you ma'am like almost overnight and then that led to alcohol and all that sort of stuff um yeah that never would have been uh because of this legal drug you know opiate uh lord tab is legal doctor prescribed it how can i get can i'm with a doctor how can i have a problem and i don't need to beat up anybody or whatever but the process kicked in and uh, here they are uh, yeah well no, you're absolutely right I, I i broke my collarbone long time ago and was prescribed uh, um, i think it was a month worth of three pills a day of hydrocodone mm -hmm. oh my goodness i mean that was i look back on that and it was a month of just floating on cloud nine mm -hmm. you know sitting in a chair i was drinking too uh, i was mm -hmm. drinking on top of the, the the pills but boy oh boy i mean i it sure agreed with me you know uh -huh. and i knew it was i was watching i was looking at the time every day you know has it has it been is it time for my next pill yet? Because I sure could use one. And then I started chewing them up, so it hit me faster. And uh, and that and that prescription had a, a refill. I could have gone another month. The pain was gone. I never. I mean, I went the first four days with that broken collarbone without pills. I it, I could have gone the whole time without any pills, and I would have been fine. But the doctor said, "Does it hurt?" And I said, "Well, hell yeah, it hurts." Well, right. Do you want something for it? And I said, "Well, sure. Why not?" You know. And, it's as easy as that. You know, I, I luckily I've, I've got, um, I mean, I get addicted to things easy, but luckily I'm conscious enough to be aware it's happening. Yeah. So, I mean, so I knew it was happening. Same exact thing happened to me, Paul. I, uh, I used to ride horses stuff and I got thrown off a horse and I broke a collarbone and they put a plate up here, right uh -huh. up here. I got a plate up here and I was probably 21, 22 years sober at that time. And uh, they prescribed the Percocet, you know, I'm an alcoholic and, and, you know, I didn't have any trouble with that and I couldn't sleep. So I started taking a pill within the doctor's, um, what it was done yep. with my sponsor and, and, and my, my wife at the time, she knew everything was going on, but it wasn't very long before I started skirting what the doctor wanted me to do. And you talk about pouring stuff down the, the toilet. I realized when, when that start, when I started skirting, you know, I recognized, Oh, okay. I know this behavior. And I went yeah. and poured that. And I know you're not supposed to do this at any, with the stuff, but I did it anyway. I went and poured it down the uh, toilet, but I'm going to tell you yeah. something. I cried. I'm, I'm unashamedly. I'm going to let you know, just that quick. I poured it down, uh, made my wife watch me while I did it. But yep. it was, I was, I lost a friend. <laughs> I kind of went golly. Yeah, it's great. I, I it, you know, drug addiction can happen to anybody. Right. Mm -hmm. It's, it's not something anybody needs to be ashamed about, whether you're, whether you're a crackhead or, a, or, a, or a, you're tripping acid every day or you're an alcoholic. It doesn't matter. That can happen to anybody. Uh, I know I'm, I'm, I was a good kid. I'm a smart person. But, but, I, but alcohol was fun and smoking weed was fun. And, I do, and when something's fun, boy, I take it and run with it. Just, that's just like being on a sailboat. 
you know, here I am living on a boat. Like I ran with that too, but you know, that's how it happened to me. It was just fun. And I ran with it and I got addicted, you know, and other, and other people, you know, have a, a, you know, trauma that leads them to it. Some people have a broken collarbone that leads them to it. It can happen to anybody. There's nothing to be ashamed about. You know, um, you'd be 22 years in the program, aware of your nature, painfully aware of your nature, but that's what saved me as I recognized it. You know, I didn't go yep. down that road. I recognized it really quick. Like, but yeah, it'll grab a hold of you. I'm not by any means proud. Right. I'm not, I'm not ashamed, right. but I'm not ashamed, but I'm not a proud either. You know, it's just what it is. Yeah. Now, your yeah, other book, you. what's it about? Uh, the, the Joy of Living Clean, clean and sober, sober. Same. Um, the Joy of Living Clean and Sober. I mean, that's what it's about. Um, it, it's, it's, it's just taking the same idea of my first book and looking at it from the, the perspective of someone who's been sober for seven years now. Um, okay. It's just going a little bit deeper into the psychology of, of alcoholism. Um, it's looking a little deeper into it instead of, uh, instead of just saying, Hey, if you want to quit, you know, I quit successfully by doing these, these things, these concrete things right here. It just takes a little bit deeper of a look into our minds and, and it's a little bit more about how to stay sober. Good. Once you've already gotten there. Um, that's, that, that's the, that was the idea behind it when I wrote it, like, I'm going to write a book about, about staying sober. Once you're a few years in, you know, how, how can you, how can you stay there and, and not go back? Um, and I also wanted to look, you know, and I did, I did quite a bit of research for the book. So I wanted to look into the, into the mind, um, and, and why we, we go down that road and, and what it is that, that makes us go there and how, and how we can, um, learn about the way we think to prevent ourselves from relapsing. Cause that's what it's all about now. You know, it's we, once we, once you've gotten out, you got to make sure you stay out of it and not yeah, go back and not, and not do what your friend did. And, and what I did and, and convince yourself that, that you have control um, because chances are you're going to lose it. You might go back and have control for a week or a month or a year or two years, but man, it, that, that, that demon is going to come right back to life in your head. If you truly and, have and, that physical addiction, it's going to come back. It, it, yeah. It's, it's, it's a little demon that it, mm -hmm. not literally, but it's, 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 <laughs> it's a little demon, like I like a computer virus, you know, let's yeah. just call it that. I'm going to call it a demon, but you can say computer virus. It's the same thing. It lives in my head and it's still there and it's always going to be there. And if I don't feed him and I don't talk to him, he's going to be very small. He's going to be like, he's going to be like a spore, you know, like, like a, like a, like a spore of a mushroom. It's, it's, yeah. it, it can come back to life, but it's not really alive, but it can come back if you, if you feed it and water it. And, and that, that sucker, man, I know, I know what he sounds like. He, he's the one who says, uh, Paul, uh, you, you know, you're driving, you're going to drive by the liquor store here in just a minute. You've only got four beers in the fridge. Now, do you really want to go home with only four beers in the fridge? You know, you're going to want to get back in the car and go say, well, let's just stop at the liquor store. No, and then right. the same guy says, Hey, uh, uh you, your truck's only got a three third of a tank of gas. You, know, you might as well stop and get gas. And while you're there, you might as well get a Foster's lager, you know, right. and put it inside your big gulp cup and put a top on it and put a straw in it. So it looks like you're drinking soda and drive on home with, with while you're drinking beer. Wouldn't that be fun? Oh, and you got weed in the car too. Let's fire up a joint. Like, why not? Who's telling you not to like that? Like, I mean, he knows exactly what to say to me to make me do it because it's me. Yeah. Like, like, you know? like the expense. It's part of me expensive. and he's still there. He's not going anywhere. Yeah. yeah. Sounds like your first book is how to get sober. And your second one's how to live sober and stay. sober. I think, cool. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. That's, good. that's great. I like that a lot. Yeah. You know, and, and that's the greatest thing in life. Um, I've experienced a lot of great things in my life. Um, I'm kind of a, kind of a great thing connoisseur. Like I, I go looking for great things like sailing and surfing and diving and all the drug use I used to do. Um, I look for great feelings and great things. Well, what the best, let me tell you what the very best is. And you guys know, you guys are going to know exactly what I'm talking about. It's when you know, you have helped somebody get sober. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing better, right? I mean, I mean I'm, I'm, I'm being literal here. Oh, there's oh, nothing oh, better. Yeah. When someone, when someone says to me, a stranger sends me a message on Instagram or something mm -hmm. and says, Hey, I read alcoholics, not anonymous or, or the joy of living clean and sober. And, and I, and I got sober and I am sober. And because of that, I got my, I got rights to my, see my children again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? 
yeah. uh, or, or, or I got to keep my job or, you know, whatever, just, I got sober, like, and I look at, and I go on Amazon and I look and see that people bought the book. Every time that book sells, I think there's, there's one more person that's, that might be getting sober. Right. You know, like that, it feels good. Yeah. It does. It, make, it gives me goosebumps. I mean, it's better than, than, than a drinking beer or smoking weed or any of that. It's so much better. Really? It's just, it's not even on the same plane. It's, it's a different order of magnitude. And the hangover is not near as bad. And uh, the consequences of the land. <laughs> right. It's all good. That's all. Not yeah. Near. It's all. And then. Good. Uh, yeah. Good we karma too. Out. I mean, I, that's. Yeah, that's fine. We about run, run out of time here, Paul. But, but, but before yep. we move on, you also have a bunch of books about how to do what you're doing there, how to get on a sailboat, how to reach those kind of dreams, live that sort of life. And then you also uh, have a podcast where you talk about that life. I saw some of the interview, some yeah. really great people, and you talk about that life and how they're doing that. So if you're interested in that, we will put in the descriptions, all of your links and stuff in this podcast and on the YouTube, uh, so that you can go Excellent. and get, um, that information. What, what is the name of your podcast? The podcast is called offshore sailing and cruising with Paul Trammell. Oh, excellent. excellent. And you can find all that on my website on yeah. paultrammell.com. Paul um, Trammell. My books. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you, books. you can find all my books for sale and, um, yeah. and the podcast. Um, and, uh, yeah, so yeah, that's awesome. But just had a great time. Uh, I, I at the Me beginning too. I said, I hate you. I'm, I don't really hate you. <laughs> I love you. I hope you continue on being self selfish. Oh. And I'm jealous. If you ever, we are in mobile, Alabama, uh, which is right. in mobile Bay. If you ever decide that you need yeah. some muddy water or whatever, you come up this way, be sure to get in touch. with I, me. I occasionally pass through Mobile because my family is all from Alexandria, Louisiana. And, oh, really? uh, and, I, and I live in Florida. So I'm, I used to live in Florida. So I've driven right past Mobile quite a few times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of people that drive past Mobile. Yeah. It, <laughs> <laughs> the interstate goes right through it. Well, yeah, <laughs> bam, hit a couple of tunnels. No, actually, Mobile's a great place. Uh, the home of Mardi Gras, all the people out there from New Orleans. Is it really? Yeah, yeah. actually, Mardi Gras, at least according to us, got started here by the guy by the name <laughs> of uh, Joe Kane. It's a really Joe Kane, right. T A I N. You might want to look that story up. It's an interesting story. Sure. All right, Vince. There we are. Another great podcast. Mm -hmm. Made a, a podcast. <laughs> podcast. <laughs> podcast. Made another great friend, Paul Trammell. Get out there yeah. in the descriptions and uh, also backportschats.com. Mm -hmm. Check us out, subscribe, book on Patreon. You know, Vince, I have to tell you, I've been dreaming of being on that boat all day. <laughs> <laughs>